All right. Um, so what I want to talk about tonight, and we'll have some time to discuss afterwards, is basically the period from the end of Reconstruction in 1877 through to the, through to the Spanish-American War in, uh, in 1898, a 20-year period in which uh, all of the features of American, the American economic development that we talked a little bit about in last week's, in last week's lecture, the, 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 the great advance of American economic development unleashed by the national unification at the end of the Civil War, that all of these features reached their maximum D -d development. I'm not going to summarize it again uh, uh, tonight, but just in outline, the, 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 the development of the railroad industry, the connections to coal and steel, the development of the oil industry beginning in, in, in Pennsylvania, the development of the electricity industry and everything connected with it from power generation to electric light and every telegraph, telephones, and and right at the end of this period, the development of the automobile industry, which of course was going to go, will, will go on to power the growth of the American economy in the, in the 20th century. All of this connected to the rise of large-scale commercial agriculture in the, in, in, in the West. The formation of giant trusts and monopolies as, uh, as free market capitalism became gradually supplanted by, by greater and greater degree of monopolize, monopolization. Standard Oil Corporation, General Electric, United U.S. Steel Corporation formed by the, by the banker J.P. JP Morgan. All of these developments in this very short period unleashed by the, by, by the national unification established by the by the, by the Civil War. One, one very obvious social consequence of this, of course, was the emergence of a, a reinforcement, shall, I, shall we say, of the class of, a super, of super rich owners of capital, the Fricks, the Vanderbilts, the Carnegies, the Morgans, the Rockefellers, collectively known as the robber barons. The, the, the titans of American, of American capital. It, and, it's, and it was their ostentatious lifestyle, the opulence of their, of their lifestyle, and that of their hangers-on, the bankers, the stockbrokers, the lawyers, the whole class of coupon clippers who could now live by, 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 by investment in the stock market without ever having to dirty their hands with the actual business of, with the actual business of production. This was actually, uh, in, on this scale, an entirely, new, an entirely new feature. It was their lifestyle that gave this period, this 20-year period, its, its name, its popular name as the, as the Gilded Age. They were the Gilded Ones but I'm not going to spend that much time talking about them. I don't find them that interesting. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't say that. They have, their, they have their moments. What I really want to look at, and what I'm going to spend most of, most of this lecture looking at, and then come back and, 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 and talk about some of the political consequences of all of this, is the, is, is the social consequences of this process of industrialization for the other end of the social spectrum. I don't know, the non-gilded the ungilded, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the enormous expansion of the American economy, of course, produced a, a, an enormous demand for labor, for workers. W where were they going to be found? One might imagine that immediately after the Civil War that there would be a large number of free, of free blacks, former slaves, willing and able to work in the factories of the northern, northern business. In fact, there was very little of this. The great, mi the great northward migrations of, of, of southern African Americans from, from African Americans from the southern states doesn't begin until the, until the First World War, a little bit, a little bit later. 
northern business, the northern states, and many working people in the north were not, were not welcoming of, Afri of African Americans, many of whom, or great majority of whom in the southern states remained tra entrapped in debt and tied to the, pretty much tied to the, tied, tied to the land. Consequently, the, 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 this great need for labor, for workers, was met primarily by, by, by enormous increase in immigration, as you, as, as, as you know, and we talked about it in, a, in, a, in, a, in earlier classes. The, the, the initial immigration into the United States, of course, had been primarily from Britain and from Northern Europe, from Ireland. What, ch what changes now is a, is a huge shift. It's often desc described as the new immigration. The great majority of immigrants between 1880 and 1920 coming from Eastern and Southern, and Southern Europe, four million Italians, two million Russian and Polish Jews, five million Poles and other Slavic peoples. En enormous, enormous inflows of population. A million Quebecois, interesting and important fact for Vermont and, and, northern, and northern New York. By 1900, 23 million out of an in total population of 76 million are immigrants. You get, a, you get a sense here of the enormous weight of the immigrant population. Strikingly, of course, very few Chinese. There had been an initial boom in Chinese immigration, initial upswing in Chinese immigration into California, to, to, to many of whom came to work on the Transcontinental Railroad in the period immediately after the Civil War. By 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act had been passed, beginning in California and then ratified as a national piece of national legislation to, to, to do exactly as it says, to keep out, to keep out the, Ch the Chinese. So most of this immigration, most of this new immigration coming from Eastern and Southern and Southern Europe. Initially, many of the immigrants were what can be described as sojourners single men who came, to, who, came to, um, who came to the United States without any intention of staying here. They were going to work for a few years. They were going to make some, some good money in the steel mills of Pencil, Pittsburgh or in the coal mines or elsewhere, and they were going to go back to their country of origin, relatively wealthy. And many do that. Over 50% in some nationalities in the early years of this immigration, but gradually and over time, the numbers who return decrease. More women emigrate, families establish themselves, particularly in, in poor urban urban districts. Communities of, of, of people from similar from, from from the same country, and begin to establish themselves as a as a permanent immigrant population. This all raises, of course, a big question. The question of citizenship. question of who's going to be admitted as a citizen of the United States. The Constitution says absolutely nothing on citizenship. There's, 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 there was, there's, no, there's no federal legislation on citizen, defining citizenship until 1790 when the first Natural, Naturalization Act was passed. The, Natural, the Naturalization Act of 1790 said that any, quote, free white person could become a citizen of the United States by moving here and, 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 and living here for some period. The period of time, the period of assimilation of naturalization was extended over time. But the important part is the free, and each word's important, free white person. One assumes when the founders and their immediate successors wrote the act, they, it, it was simply obvious to them what this meant, what white meant. But of course, it's far from obvious. It has no biological and scientific, and scientific root. It's a social category. Were Italians white? 
Were Greeks white? Were Armenians, were Jews white? All of these questions had to be, had to be discussed, had to be decided. First case is heard in, 17, in 1878. It's part of this process of the, new, of the new immigration. The Chinese are not white. Well, that wasn't very difficult for them. <laughs> Rationale, scientific evidence, common knowledge, and congressional intent. 1880, natives, natives, Native Americans, not white. Rationale, legal precedent. Also in 18, 1818, a little more tricky case here. Persons half white, half native, and, uh, uh, and half native are not white. Rationale, scientific evidence. Burme and I'll just summarize some of the other. Burmese are not white. Japanese are not white. Mexicans are not white. Legal precedent cited as the justification in that, in that case. By 1909, they were, they were discussing that this, this is a Supreme Court case. No, sorry, this is a New York District case. Persons half white, one quarter Japanese and one quarter Chinese. The ruling, not surprisingly, they're not white. Congressional intent was the rationale. The point I'm making, and one could go on, there's literally dozens of these, dozens of these cases in various legal jurisdictions in the, in the United States, is that, is that whiteness is a fluid category. Socially determined category which was going to be argued out and debated out within the, within the, within the legal system of the, of the elite to determine who could and who could not, who would and who would not be admitted to citizenship. Scientific evidence, I mean, we all laugh about it, but this is absolutely deadly serious. Scientific evidence that races were different, not just black and white, which was considered and probably still is by most people considered obvious, it, it's far from obvious in reality, of course. But Aryans, Mediterraneans, Slavs, Jews, all scientifically different races with different characteristics. Aryans are at the top. Negroes were placed at the bottom. And Mediterraneans somewhere in the middle. This is absolutely, this is absolutely, and of course as they begin to try and figure this out, as they begin to put, a, to put this together, you have to put it together now because until, until this point, this had not been a question, that whiteness was simply obvious. It's no longer obvious. This is, this is the point at which the first legal rest federal restrictions on immigration start to be put in place. The first Immigration Act, 1882. Ellis Island built, fed federal institution built 1891. Of course, Immigration Acts are never, are never enacted to keep people out. Walls are never built to keep people out. This is a complete fallacy. They're built to keep those who get in down and subordinate, and this was the function of all of this legislation. Head taxes, you were gonna have to pay some amount to register yourself as a citizen when you got to Ellis Island, and certain categories were gonna be excluded. Convicts, polygamists, prostitutes, mentally defectives, pu people who might become a public charge, all of whom would be excluded from the possibilities of American citizens, even if they were white, even if they got through that. 1903, anarchists were added to the list of people unsuitable for American citizenship. You can see how layer after layer after layer of, piece of, of immigration law putting this together, defining, defining citizenship on, a, on, 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 on allegedly scientific racial racial categories, culminates in the 1921 Immigration Act. We'll say some, some more about that in a later, in a, in, in a later class. So this is the, this is the first great con social consequence 
of the uh, 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 of the industrial of this great of this great industrial co a a expansion. Well, they had reason to be worried about anarchists. It wasn't just. It, it was true that many of the immigrants coming into the United States had, exper had experience in, f in, in labor battles and battles over land in their, country, in their countries of origin, and they entered, they entered a working class. We talked about some of the conditions in the last, in the last lecture where, 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 the, where, where the raw and brutal character of American industry provoked over and over and over furious resistance from labor, from, 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 labor, from workers, and a series of, 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 of violent and bloody confrontations which tended to flare up in the periods of industrial, of, of industrial down, downturn. 1886, the massive movement for, for the eight-hour day is launched in the United States, May Day, the International Workers' Day, first established in the United States as workers fought to limit the, to leg, to the legal limitation on the, on the working day. L Labor Day in September, whenever it is, end of August or September, whenever the hell it is, was established specifically as, an as a safe alternative to, to, to American workers joining in what had become by that time an international, an international day of, uh, of, of labor. But this began in the United States. It began in the struggle for the eight hour, for the legal eight hour day. This was connected to the, right, to, to the rise of the first great radical working class movement in American history, the Knights of, the Knights of Labor. A, amazing organization f develops in the 1880s at its peak at its peak in the struggle for the eight-hour day, well over 700,000 members. Included blacks in its membership, included women, advocated for women's suffrage, was something between a, something between a trade union and a sort of self-help co cooperative movement. Its membership dwindled away at the end of the 1880s as the, as the business cycle, as the business cycle recovered, but then it plunges down again in the, 19, in the 1890s, and you have an, a further series of, uh, 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 of pitch battles. 1892, the Homestead, homestead Strike of the, of the Carnegie, in the Carnegie Steel Mills in Pittsburgh. Pitch battle culminating in the death of seven, seven uh, Pinkerton detectives and, and nine strikers. Two years later, the Pullman strike just outside of, 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 of Chicago, the, 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 the factory where Pullman rail cars were built. Strike led by Eugene V. Debs and the, and the Rail Workers Union. 14,000 federal troops, federal troops and state militia, sent to, break, sent to break the strike. Pitch battle over a huge area of rail yards and other factories. But, Buildings burnt to the ground, and Eugene V. Debs jailed as a result. Big mistake, he sits in prison reading Marx. <laughs> Goes on to found the Socialist Party, and we'll talk about that in a later class. The, 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 the issue here, the, 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 the challenge here for working people was to build some form of stable organization. The pattern was for, for unions to rise in periods of economic crisis when, 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 when unemployment was rising, when wages were being driven down, and to dissipate in periods of economic prosperity. The, the, the one exception to this, 1886, was the foundation of the American Federation of Labor, a craft union that, that set out not to organize the great majority of working people, but to organize skill, skilled workers many of them British and Northern European, not non-immigrants. They prided themselves on what, what quickly became called, their, known as their business unionism, their willingness to collaborate with, with, with management to secure better wages and conditions for themselves, often at the expense of, uh, 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 of less skilled workers. 
the division amongst working people between, the skill, between skilled and unskilled workers. This division between organized, organizations like the Knights of Labor on the one hand and the American Federation of Labor on the other is going gonna, is gonna to be a con constant theme running through American labor history. We'll touch on it in a couple of other, couple of other instances. As all this was unfolding in the, nor in the industrial Northeast and the great industrial cities of the Midwest, we talked a little bit about the, 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 the defeat of, of Reconstruction after the Civil War. I want to look, I wanna look now that in this, in this subsequent period, the consolidation of Jim Crow segregation in, in the South, the, the, the period that followed the withdrawal of federal troops from the South in 1877. The, the Southern elite, we talked about this before, pu pushing back, pushing, pushing African Americans back as close as they could get to re-establishing slavery. They're never able, they're never going to be able to re-establish slavery. Pushing as close as they could, as restrictive, as many restrictions, tying, tying African Americans as deeply as they could into, into, into debt slavery. Redeeming the southern states politically, establishing Democratic Party governments in every, single in every single southern states, and backing this by the, by, 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 the by the armed wing of the Democratic Party, the Ku Klux Klan and the other vigilante, white vigilante organizations. By the 1890s, over 200 lynchings a year being recorded in the United States. It, uh, it leaves open the question of the undoubtedly many, many more that simply, that simply were, never, were never recorded. Public spectacles. I, I think a lot of, you kind of think of lynching as something that's done in the dark and back roads. A lot, a lot of this was done in ta totally openly in town squares, uh, off, off, off bridges, off highway bridges or railroad bridges with big crowds assembling to watch. Word being passed out over days beforehand. Outside the law, but entirely condoned by, by, by the law as part of the apparatus of terror directed against, Africa, directed against African Americans and part of the effort to bulldoze them. This is the, when the term, the origin of the term, to bulldoze them away from exercising their legal right, constitutional right to vote. This is all going to be backed increasingly step by step by step during the 1880s and 1890s by the consolidation of legal segregation in the South, particularly in public accommodations of, 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 of all sorts, from, rail, from, from railroad cars to schools to housing, to hotels, to every, every sort of, we're going to be increasingly segregated. In 1883, the, civil, the, the Supreme Court of the United States heard a series of cases. Collectively, they became known as the Civil Rights Cases, and where, where the Supreme Court struck down the constitutionality or found unconstitutional the 1875 Civil Rights Act, one of the last pieces of Reconstruction legislation. And it argued that the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, the, the amendment guaranteeing equal, equal rights, did not apply to private, to private individuals or to businesses. In other words, it applied to the relationship between the federal government and, 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 and people, not, not, not. In other words, it was totally legal for an individual to say they didn't want to sell their house to a black person, they didn't want to serve, serve food to a black person, they didn't want to have them ride in their rail car, they didn't want to have them sit in their school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This opened the way to, 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 the, to, the, le to the increased legal segregation on all of these. This didn't go down without a fight. Challenged by, in particular, the most famous case by Homer Plessy, who challenged the Louisiana Railroad Act, the so-called Separate Car Act, 
he was a, he, he was a, an African American who, who 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 had the temerity to ride in uh, and deliberately to provoke the question to ride in a whites only rail car was arrested and, and, and took the case all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, by a majority of seven to one, upheld the legality of the so-called separate but equal provisions of, uh, 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 of segregated rail cars. And, and, and it was the critical decision in legitimizing, the, in legitimizing segrega segregation. It's worth looking at the, at the makeup of the Supreme Court. Here, here are the states from which these Supreme Court judges were drawn. New York, Pennsylvania, two from Massachusetts, Connecticut, Kentucky, and Louisiana. And presiding, presiding over this was Chief Justice Melville Fuller from Maine, a uh, alumni of Bowdoin College, great liberal institution. This was not the crackers. This was not the. This was not the the the, the 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 southern crazy southern racists. This was being legitimized by the Supreme Court of the United States. Most of these guys were, were former Union officers. Most of these guys had fought in the Civil War. These Supreme Court. These Supreme Court. It shows you the degree to which the ruling elite in the United States had recomposed itself following the following following the following the war as a national class. The New South, as it became known, business friendly, open for business, open for Yankee investment, and indeed it was friendly. Wages in the South for whites, for white workers in the South, in the region of 40% lower than workers doing equivalent jobs in northern, in North. This, this is often described, this is described as, as the wages of whiteness. This is what you get for segregate. This is the wages of segregation. In 1880, only 5% of American cotton was spun in southern factories, in factories based in the south. By 1900, 23%, huge influx of, of, of northern capital into the southern states to take advantage of this cheap labor, developing also into tobacco, steel, and, and, a, number of, and, a, number of other and a number of other sectors. So here's the, here's, the, here's the social consequence of all this in terms of the, of, the, of the intensification of segregation. The final area of social consequence I want to look at is in terms of, in terms of family farmers, small farmers particularly in the, in the Midwest, where, where the monopolization of American business bore down particularly, particularly heavily. Family farmers f f faced monopoly. If you, if you wanted to get your produce to market, you didn't have any choice about which railroad you were going to use. You often didn't have any choice about who was who you, which pro food processor you were going to sell your, 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 uh, your, your products to, your, your crops to. You, you were dealing with a monopoly. You could take your you could take your grain someplace else, but you weren't going to be able to transport it. You weren't going to be able to process it. And 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 as those businesses became monopolized, so rates rose, the rates charged to farmers rose, the indebtedness of family farmers family farmers deepened. This stimulated the great co-op, the rise of the great cooperative movement, the Grange, formed right after the Civil War in the late in, 18, in 1867. By, eight, by the 1870s, over 800,000 members of, of the National Grange Organization, organization of farmers, on a simple principle. If we, if, we, if we face the monopoly as individuals, we're going to get screwed. If we unite and, and say nobody's going to sell their grain until you lower the price, you've got some real, you've got some real leverage. This reached its high point in 1877 with the famous case brought by, brought, brought by the Grange in, uh, uh, of Mon versus Illinois, versus the state of Illinois. Uh, 
it, it, dealt with, it dealt with the provision of, 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 of grain elevators and the control of grain elevators by, by, by monopolies. The state of Illinois found, quote, that grain elevators were, were quote, a public utility, uh, sorry, a private utility run in the public interest. In case Ray P. calls listening. A public interest. Private company run in a pro public interest and therefore, was op and therefore should, be, should be liable to, should be susceptible to regulation by the state. That the state could intervene to set the rates in the grain elevators at a reasonable, at a reasonable level. It was, a great, it was the greatest single victory of the, uh, of, of the, grain, of the Grange movement. This all spun off, or, or, or developed into, I should say, into, 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 the, into a broader political movement of agrarian populism in the, in, in the West and also to some degree in the southern states, beginning in the later 1870s and going right through to the end of the, to, to the 18, into the 1890s. The, 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 the populists took the, this challenge to, 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 to the prerogatives of big business E e even further, and waged and, 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 and ran a political campaign. Like many small business people, it had a kind of cranky edge to it. The, the, populist, the populist argued that if only currency was, made, was, was silverized, based on silver rather than on gold, we could put the, 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 the price of money could be brought down, interest rates could be brought down, easy credit could be available, and so on. A lot, a lot of their campaigns were directed towards, towards, to, to, towards the, the, silver, the monetarization of silver, which has something of a, I don't know, something of a thing that's not going to really work uh, uh, about it. Many of their demands, many of their demands had that. But the, but the movement as a whole, as they put it, raising, raising less grain and or less corn and more hell, protesting the conditions of rural, rural life and putting that at the center stage of, of, of politics. This was a powerful movement. It linked up with workers facing their own issues along the lines I've just, I, I, I've, I've just been describing. The, the, the commonality between the interests of workers and interests of family, of family farmers. In the South, for a period, it even, it even reached across class lines, the populist, across color lines, I should say. The, the populist movement in the South, specifically appealing to, 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 to African Americans as well as to poor, to poor white farmers in, 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 in the South. Forming itself into the People's Party 1892, the People's Party, in the, in the presidential election of 1892, the People's Party carries six states in the, in the West. Very, very substantial third party, thir third party challenge. Uh, on the basis of this resistance of farmers and their supporters and their allies in, amongst working people to, 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 to the impact of the monopolization of, uh, of the American, uh, of the American economy. I want to look now briefly at how this all plays, uh, how this all plays out at the, level of at the level of national politics. I don't know, how many people can actually name the presidents of the United States between 1876 and 1896? Very few. Can anyone? Well, yeah, other than Sharpie. <laughs> I mean, I have to, every time I look at this, I have to go and look at the, I have to go to Wikipedia and, and, and write them. <laughs> And write them down and write them down again because I can never remember them. Rutherford Hayes. Well, I did talk about Rutherford Hayes before. He's the, he was the guy who negotiated the the, the compromise of 1876 and the and the end of Reconstruction in the South. Republican, rep, Republican, elected in 1876. James Garfield elected in 1880 gets assassinated. His vice president Chester Arthur take take takes over 1881. Grover Cleveland, the first Democratic president since the Civil War, 1884. Benjamin Harrison, 1888. Grover Cleveland comes back again, 1892. And then William McKinley, 18, 1896. Almost completely unheard of presidents. Okay. <laughs> 
Why is this? Either they're totally useless, which is really not the case, or, or, or it's reflective of something. It's reflective of the confidence of the, uh, of the, it's a reflective of the Gilded Age. It's reflective of the confidence of the American elite that society is going in the direction they, they like, they approve of. They, they face no massive questions of international or, or, or politics. They, the, 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 the big names that are, are the Robert Barons, the big names that are the Fricks and the Carnegies and the Rockefeller, those are the names we remember from this period w with, good, with, good, with good reason. They're the ones who put their... But what's been put together here? I mean, you look at, if you look at it, it party-wise, instead of reading names that none of us will remember, you get a little different sense of it. Republican, Republican, Republican. Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican. See a pattern in this last period. Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican. Something's been put together here which is the re-establishment of the two-party system as the archetypal political, political organization of American, of, of American society. This had disintegrated. This had existed in it before, before the Civil War, but it disin disintegrated in the, in the pre-war crisis and now is put back together in this new period of relative prosperity for American, for American business. If you, don't like, if you don't like these guys, you can always vote for these guys. And if these guys piss you off, you can vote for these guys. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, it's, it becomes, as I said, the, 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 the archetypal structure of American, of, of American politics. And it's put back together in this period of stabil relative stability and prosperity for business. I'm not talking about the conditions for working people. Both of, these, both of these parties, the Democratic and Republican Party, simply represent different sections or are based on different sections of the capitalist elite, the Southern, the, 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 the southern business interests in the Democratic Party, Northern industrial capitalism in the Republican Party. But each one of these parties reaches for, reaches for popular support. The Democrats, reach into the northern working class, particularly to immigrant workers. The Republicans reach into, the, into, into African Americans in, 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 in the South. The Republican Party is the party of African Americans in the South until, until the Depression, at least. So here's, here's this, here's this two-party system being put in place. And here, in the 1890s, is this tremendous challenge rising this wind of challenge rising from the populist, from the populist movement in the, in, 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 in the West, with its registering this, this substantial third-party challenge in the, 18, in the 1892 election. The Democrats respond to this, to this challenge, to this populist challenge. In 1896, they went run William Jennings Bryan a, Western, a Westerner, a Western populist, free silver supporter as the Democratic Party, as the Democratic Party candidate in the, in the 1896 gen presidential election. The, pop, the People's Party, instead of running its own independent candidate as, as it had done the previous year, votes in its majority to support William Jennings Bryan, to support the Democratic Party. doesn't do them any good. They lose the election. McKinley, Mc, Republican candidate McKinley, William McKinley wins, backed by big, by big business interests and playing, on the, and playing on the concerns of workers in the North that free silver would lead to rapid inflation and an erosion of their, uh, 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 of their, of their wages. But a critical piece I want to look at, the, the final thing I want to, I, I'm, final point I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make is, this, is, is, is the absorption Back into the two, back into the two-party system, of the, of this third-party break, of this third-party effort of the of, of, of the People's Party, and it's and the ability of the Democrats to simply reach out and draw that back in, 
corral that, corral that back in to the, to, to, to the two-party system. It remains, I would argue, the, the, the method of operation of the two-party system as they respond to various third-party challenges. We're going to see the Bull Moose Party and, the, and, 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 uh, and uh, Roosevelt. We're going we're to see all kinds of labor developments in the, 18, in the, in the 1930s and other, and, 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 other, and other developments. Always get pulled back. Always get pulled back into the, into the, into the, into the structure of two-party of two politics. Well, of course, as, as, as the stability and growth on which the two-party system base, is based run, runs into difficulties, W w you start to see periods in which, just as it happened before the Civil War, periods in which that two-party structure starts to, starts to fragment, in which third parties of, of various kinds arise, in which the old... I, 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 I made the point previously that, 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 that I would contend that this is precisely the kind of period we're starting to, we're starting to move, in, m move into to today. Um, the challenge for both of the major parties and you can see it vividly in, in terms of the Republican Party and the Tea Party movement, is, the, is, is, to draw this, is to draw this back into the framework of the two-party system, which is exactly what the Democrats do successfully, prevent, prevent the emergence of a genuinely independent third party, a party based on, on, on small farmers and, and, and workers in the, in, in the, in the 1890s. The, the, the election of McKinley in 1896, coming, coming at the end of this period, now prepares, politically prepares the, next, the whole next stage in the development of, uh, the development of American history, which is, which, which, is, which is the preparation and then the execution of the turn of American, of, of American business and of, American, of, of the American state from, simply, from sim lim, simply looking within the United States to adopting a, 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 an, international, an international role. 1898, of course, we're going to see the, 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 the Spanish-American War. We're going to see the beginnings of, as its supporters called it at the time, imperialism, and, and, and opening a whole new period, a whole new period in American history. But we'll come back and talk about that in, in, in due course. Well, this, is the, this is the character of the Gilded Age, which I wanted to focus on tonight, and we can take some questions and discussion on, uh, on, on that. Okay. Yeah. Why did the... Um did the Workers' Party or the, the, the People's Party? People's Party. Well, why? What, what what were they given, or what? Can you talk a little bit more about the details as, as, as to why they decided to support the Democratic candidate? Um, I mean, part of it was was the the question was why did people why did the People's Party support the, the Democrats in in 1896? I mean, part of it was Brian was a very effective candidate. I mean, he, he, he came out of this uh, kind of fundamentalist Christian, kind of very uh, uh, muscular Christianity. His, his campaign, his campaign um, slogans made a lot, of ref a, lot of religious, a lot of religious appeal to them. They, he, 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 uh, he, he, he was particularly, um, particularly, uh, uh, I want to say aggressive, particularly popularized the question of the, uh, of, the uh, of, of, of free silver. This was basically the one the one issue that he campaigned on was the, was the silver question. That although he had other stuff he talked about, he was a he was a pacifist and stuff as well, or alleged alleged to be. He goes on to become Wilson's Wilson's uh, Secretary of State, but that's a whole whole other matter. Um, so he put forward this, and th and here's this major party. I mean, here's one of the major parties espousing the or appearing to espouse the main political issues that the populists had been, had been raising. So, I mean, it's very, very attractive um, for, from that point of view. The other side of it, however, is I think that there was no, you know, I, I'd kind of, I, 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 the, 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 the populists themselves never had a very clear program of what they were for. I mean, they, they, they knew very well what they were against. Okay, they were getting, they were get, they had a lot of, pot, they had all these, mon they had the, the, the rail monopolies, they had the grain elevator monopolies, they had all the, all, they had the, they had, they had the banks, 
They had high interest rates. They had all of it. But what do you do about it? What do you do about it? And that's where the silver issue, and it got, and so the silver thing gets raised as a panacea. If only we could get easy credit, if only we could have, I mean, it's, it's, it, you hear the same thing today in this, in, this, in this budget stuff. If only we could get away from the budget surplus, everything, it's a panacea, all of these, they, they, they seem, they're a simple little thing that, se that anyone can understand. And seem to offer and seem to offer the, the the answer. If only we had, if only money was more freely. If only interest rates were lower. If only money. If only all the money wasn't being monopolized by these, by these greedy Eastern capitalists who can afford to pay the high interest rates. And go, um, um, uh, then we'd all be, we'd, we'd all be, we could, would be happy. So they don't challenge. I mean, I guess my point would be at the, at the end of the day, they don't challenge. The actual functioning of the system itself, they challenge its worst, they challenge its worst excesses. So when the Democrats kind of reach out to them and, and suddenly you're going from a party that could maybe win seven, seven states to a party that, hey, maybe we're gonna, we can support a guy who's actually gonna win the presidency. It, it, it's, very, it's, very, it's very powerful. So I think there's, I think there's the attraction of Brian I and I think there's the I think there's the character of populism and what, and, and it's and it and it's difficulty in putting forward a real positive challenge that it was that it was really for, other than other than something. And there were a lot of other panaceas. There's people advocating flat taxes. There's all kinds of there's all kinds of stuff, you know, of that of that nature. If only we could find. If only we could find some way of ameliorating the the, the way capitalism functions. By, by one of these kind of regulating this or making that a little, that was the, I think that was the, that, that was the issue. Yeah. All those immigrants that you said came, how, how did they know to come here? Was there something going on over in their countries that want, they wanted to get out or was somehow the word get out from this country that there are jobs to be had? I, I, I think both. I mean, again, I think there's a pull and a, and a, and a push. Certainly, this is a period of, uh, particularly in, for, for Jews in East, I mean, and, and most Jews are, are working people in this period. I mean, peasants, they're coming from peasants or small artisan backgrounds in Eastern Europe and the, and the, and the victim of vicious pogroms from the, from the, Russian, from the Russian state. So there's a, there's a specific push, and, 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 for most of, and for most of the, you know, the conditions of a peasant farmer in Sicily or in Greece were pretty darn wretched. Um, so there's, and, and then you start hearing about, and the point about these sojourners, the point about these people who co go and come, go back, I mean, people, are, people make, sev so some of these folks make several trips across, I mean, it's, you know, and this is all, when you, you know what travel's going to take. All of this is incredibly difficult, incredibly time-consuming, and they go and they go and they make some money, and they come back, and they go back, and they back, and they, uh, you know, and they come back, and they, I mean, there's these ama wonderful testimonials of these, of, of, of these, you know, and little kids will be there in the village square, and the guy will come back, and he's, you know, he's got beautiful shoes and a nice suit, and, you know, he's had a little bit of money. I mean, he's worked. 15 hours a day in a Pennsylvania steel mill, but, but you have some money. Um, you know, and, he, and this one guy reports, you know, and the president comes round and, 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 and he's called Teddy. This is a little bit later, this is Roosevelt. Um, you know, you could call the president has a nickname. Uh, it, it's mind blowing to, to, to someone living in the Austro Hungarian em Empire. You're not a citizen of the Austro Hungarian Empire, you're a subject. So, all of that stuff. There's a powerful push, and then there's, and then, and, and then, America, despite all the, you know, the restrictions we were talking about, and all of the other stuff, is, is basically we need these people. You know, this is when the, this is when the uh, Statue of Liberty's, the, the little, the, the wretched and bring, uh, bring me to whatever all that huddled masses and all that stuff. I mean, it's a pretty horrible verse, but, but the idea that this is the, this is the sanctuary. This is the, this is where you can. You can make you can make money here, and 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 it, it, I mean all of this stuff has a reality. It, it has it has has a reality compared to the, compared to the countries that they come from. So it starts to it starts to build and it builds and it, and 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 it, and it builds. And so I think it's both a push and a both a push and a, and a pull. I mean you could get into more specific detail of exactly which years particular groups of people, you know, there's ups and downs in it are particularly pushed. Um, 
but but uh, that that's the main the main the main characteristic. Yeah. Are you still seeing the expansion into the West that is is, is land still available, or are there these waves of immigrants as in prior generations sort of moving on to become farmers in the West? Is this is that era over during this this period? Uh, I mean it. The question was, are you still seeing expansion into the West, or is that basically, is that basically over? I mean, it's slow, it, it dries up um, dur during this period. I mean, and, and the process in the West mirrors the process in the American economy as a whole, which you see, you see small, I mean, this is the period in which you see, in which you see wars between, the big, between big ranchers and, small, and, and smallholders as they, as they start being, that pressure on their land, driven, dri people dri driven off their land as, as land becomes concentrated into larger land. So you have, the same, you have that same phenomenon go, 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 going on. So land, after being a lot of land being available right after the Civil War and the Homestead Act and the huge, and the huge movement into the West, by the 1880s and 1890s, there's very little, there's very little land available um, in, most of, in, most of the in most of the American West. You're seeing that same process. Um, I mean, there's not a lot of Italian farmers in the, in the I mean, I'm not saying there's none, but as a, cat, as a category, or, as, or, or Greeks, or, or Poles, this, is, this, 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 this opportunity to get out of the eastern and, and uh, industrial city starts to, starts to, close, starts to close down um, at, at, exactly, at exactly this time. And of course, as that, as that and uh, the American elite worries terribly about this. That, we're, that, that we've always had this safety valve that we've avoided. Uh, we, we've avoided the social tensions of Europe. We've avoided the class conflicts of Europe because we've always had this availability of land. That if you were, you know, you could always go, you could always go and, and try and try and make a fortune someplace else. And that and that ends. And so they become very concerned. The American, the, the ruling class, becomes very concerned that you're bottling this up, and the pressure's building up and building up. And it's it's actually what ideologically it's one of the features that then leads them to wanna to, to look for overseas overseas outlets, overseas markets to start to to start to, to start that process of, of international of international expansion, which begins just a couple of years later in eighteen in eighteen ninety eight. Any other questions? Yeah. What became of the Knights of Labour? I forget when the last chapter was deactivated. It was, I think, in the 1915 or something like that. I mean, basically, it it hung on for it hung on for a while. But it, it by the, it, the after that peak of membership in whatever 1886 or 1887, 700 and something thousand. By the end of the decade, it's 100 thousand, and it it just because see, it never became a it never became either a political party. Or, or, an in, or a real industrial union. It, 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 was a, it, it had some kind of, it's early in this process and it has this very, very sort of um, uh, multifaceted kind of character, part, part, uh, part, uh, part union, part political party, part self -welf welfare organization, part club, part, I mean it's all of those, but none of, none of them does it really so it never really, for example, that, that, uh, and they divide on a lot of these questions. Should you run, should you run candidates in elections? Is this, something working, is this something workers should organize themselves to do? Many of the most radical, m most radical elements say no. It's just a game between the rich and workers are never gonna get elected. They're never gonna let workers get elected. Why would you bother? So, so, that, uh, so that, that tension, and then the question of, of, of the difficulty of actually organizing a mass, an industrial union, rather than a craft union, an industrial, uh, industrial union, that, that, that doesn't get solved until the, 19, till the, till the, till the 1930s, when you have the unionization of, of auto and basic steel. And that's when, that's when you really get industrial unionism. All these other efforts, including the International Workers of the World, the Wobblies, which is a very similar organization to the, to the Knights of Labor in some ways, have this have this sort of cyclical, cyclical character to their to their, to their membership, but but at their height they were I mean you know, nearly three quarters of a million members. I mean this is significant. It, ha it was a significant organisation, and connected to this, to this real to this real struggle for the eight for the eight hour day. I mean that was the the main driving the main driving force of it. So, um, but it could ne it, once that had once that had 
I mean, some of the stuff was won, um, and, and, and then you had the economic recovery and the, the, the urgency of organization kind of, went, kind of went away. So it all had this sort of cyclical and episodic, episodic character. And again, it, same as with the People's Party, it never, it never, what are we for? Are we for, make, are we for ref, making capitalism better? Are we for, I mean, that's a, a reasonable argument. Or, 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 or do we think this whole system's got to be changed? I mean, that tension's, all, that tension's always there uh, uh, as, uh, as well. So it's kind of, yeah. Um, do you think that, what is the connection between uh, the economic prosperity and the political polarization that you talked about? What, what is, is there a sort of line of cause and effect there that you think you could follow? Um, the question's about prosperity, periods of prosperity and, and, political, and political polarization. Um, I, I think as a general principle, one would argue that, 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 that the more polarized the, the economic situation, the more polarized politics. So that the, 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 the rise of the People's Party in the, eight, in, in, in the 1890s coincides with the, with the economic downturn in the 1890s and the impact of that and people really feeling, I mean, this is when third, I mean, historically, this is when third party parties emerge as, as economic conditions worsen, as confidence in the system erodes, as confidence in the traditional two parties erodes. Um, so I think it's connect, I think it's very much connected, connected to that. And part of the thing on the, on the ability of the, I mean, this is going back to an earlier question, part of the thing on the ability of the Democrats to kind of overcome this was, was the economic situation starts to improve towards the end of the, 18, of the 18, 1890s. People, money is easier. The immediate crisis kind of gets staved off. So, I mean, I think that would be the, I, I, I think that's the general, um, I mean, I don't think you can draw, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one thing because there's, because there's, a, there's a time lag. I mean, you're gonna find the economic, and again, you can think about some of these things in relation to developments today. That the, the economic, the, the, the impact of the economic crisis precedes, by some period, the development of political responses to it. I mean, generally, in the first couple of years of, of a depression, people are just stunned, and, and and it's very hard to formulate any clear response. People's everything you've believed to be true for the last period is suddenly taken away from you. The idea you're going to have a job and a house, and <laughs> and suddenly you don't. You know, and that's. And, that's a shocking. That's a shocking thing. It takes time to and it takes time to. So if you look in the Great Depression, the third is the political response comes comes much later than the actual hit than the than the crisis itself hits. So that they're not synchronized in that way. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Any others? Two parts of what? Okay. Yeah. That's a great question. But it's only one part, but it's a great question. <laughs> I mean, there's a t the, the question was what happens to, I mean, ordinary soldiers, right? And their, their consciousness of, in the period, uh, in this period, after the defeat of Reconstruction. Okay. Basically, what happens is there's a tension between remembering the war as a struggle against injustice and a struggle against slavery and, and that memory, that, that, that memory of what the war was about. And, and, the idea that, and the idea that we've got to put all this behind us now. This was a terrible mistake, well, this was a terrible tragedy that happened. And, uh, and, and, and what we really need to do is put all this behind us and, and find ways to reconcile with, the, with North and South. So that's the, and the third thing is the southern, is the, is, the, is the specific southern version, which remembers this as the lost cause, which was this is our, this was our heroic, you know, we, 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 we were not beaten, we were simply crushed by the superior numbers of the Union and 
and, uh, 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 and our society and our way of life was better, that we're going to get as much cl as close back to that as, to, as we can. Um, the southern way of life, we're going to try and defend the southern way of life. We're, we're, we're going to redeem the southern states. Well, what happens is that over, uh, over, over this period, that the, the, that the memory of the war as a, as a war of, uh, 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 of, uh, against slavery basically gets replaced by, by, the reconcil by reconciliationist ideas in which the, South, the lost cause has a big, plays a big part in that. And, 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 the, uh, and the memory of the war as a war of, uh, 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 against slavery basically is, is, is suppressed. I mean, it's very striking. If you look, at, if you look, at, if you look specifically, for example, at, uh, at Memorial Day, at the institution of Memorial Day. I mean, Memorial Day begins in the South. It's started by, 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 by African Americans, and it's, and it's started to commemorate the Union dead who fought for our freedom. That's how it begins. And it's taken, up, it's taken up in states across the North by the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the, the veterans' organization of the Union Army. And, they, and, state after, and the states start legislating it, legislating to have a, actual state holidays, which init, and, they, and initially they're going to give, you know, former Union officers will give speeches about the war, war against slavery and blah. But, 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 but it very quickly, this other, this other, this, uh, this reconciliationist, after the defeat of Reconstruction, this reconciliationist thing, you could, I mean, you could literally, and, and people have done studies in Vermont and other states, you just studied a, the Memorial Day speeches over, over a 10 or 15 year period. At the end of it, people, they're, they're basically, these speeches are, you know, they may, 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 may make some little reference to slavery or something like that, but the main thing they're going to talk about is the, rec the, the, the gallantry of the South, our, our common heroism, the tragedy of the division, and all of those, and all of those kind of, all of those kind of. So, a, a different, a new memory or a different memory gets put into place, and you start having these blue-gray reunions, former veterans. You know, by the 50th anniversary of Gettysburg, former veterans meet and they they reenact Pickett's Charge and they shake hands over the stone wall and. You know, and and, 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 and and leading politicians come and address them, and, and it becomes this it becomes this vehicle of national reconciliation, and and and, in, and increasingly associated with the projection of American Americanism uh, uh, overseas, um, the, 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 the particularly the Spanish American War, which is the first time a former Confederate actually commands commands a, 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 a federal ar a federal army in, in, in combat in action. And, 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 gets and it gets turned, towards, gets turned towards that. And of course, African, I mean, it's not that, it's not that the other memory, I mean, the other memory never completely goes away, but it, but it, but it, gets, very much put, it gets very much pushed back. People like Frederick Douglass, I mean, Douglass makes this famous speech in, in the eight, early 1880s, you know, where he, where he just, he says, he just insists there was, a, that, you know, for all that's been said, all that's been said and done, there was a right side in this war, and there was a wrong side. There was, it, was, it wasn't all just Americans in this together kind of thing, but I think if you think about a lot of the way the war's still presented to this day, um, that this idea of the terrible tragedy and brother against brother and all of this sort of stuff, rather than presenting it as what it, as what it really was, which was the completion of the American Revolution, and the, the necessary, yeah, bloody and regret, regrettably bloody, let's say, but there was no way that slavery was going to simply abolish itself out of existence. That was not the direction the thing was, the thing was going in. Um, so, that, so that question, um, by the, certainly by 1900, is basically the, 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 the popular memory of the war is, is, of, is of reconciliation and soldiers, the, the common heroism. There's some great stuff written on it, actually, which you, I can, if you're interested in. There's some really... I mean, it's worth thinking about from a broader perspective, because I mean, you know, how, how, how memory gets constructed, how, how, how societies remember things, um, particularly wars, is, is, it, is it, you know, how, how do we remember World War II, for example? We'll talk about, you know, that in, in, uh, how, how those memories are put together by movies and novels and all the, all the and, and, and school history syllabuses and, <laughs> 
all of, all of, this, all of this stuff, right, um, creating a memory of what this war was really about, creating a memory of what the Civil War was about and what it wasn't about. Um, so I think that's, it's very much, I, it's, I'm glad you read this, it really is a piece of, it, it's, it, it, it kind of, it was absolutely necessary to kind of draw, draw this whole process that, that I've been describing, to draw this whole thing, this whole thing together. How would you, dis how could you ex explain it otherwise? Here we are, you know, we're still, we're still, what, like 40 years after the end of the war, 30 years after the end of the war, um, and, 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 and yet the war's completely forgotten as what it really, as what it really was. It's, it's a tremendous thing that's happened, so. Okay, as usual, yeah, I think that, oh, sorry, one more quick, qu let's do one, one, one more quick question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The question was, is this the, it, laying aside the question of African Americans, right, where it's been obvious for some period, is this the first, is this the first period in American history where you start to see antagonistic social classes, I guess is the question, right? Um, uh, yes and no. I, I mean, I would argue that, I mean, I mean, this at all, United States had always been a class-divided society, but the but the but the but the gap, the 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 the, 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 the there was a reality of a, of the small landholding, yeoman farmer base of the of the economy for a whole period, um, coming out coming out of the revolutionary or coming out of the land that was taken from the from the uh, loyalists and redistributed during the Revolutionary War, coming out of the availability of land in, 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 the, in the West. So those, so those class distinctions were, were muffled to, su to, su to some degree. And um, you had this other overriding question, which is there wasn't a genuinely, genuinely unified national, there wasn't a genuinely unified country. There were, two, there were two social systems at war with each other in this, and that was the, that was the fundamental question. That was the, the main divide. But as soon as that's resolved, this is the, also relates to the, the, the point about the end of Reconstruction. As soon as that's resolved by, by, the, 18, by the end of the 1870s, um, it's absolutely, its resolution is absolutely s simultaneous with the rise of, of much sharper class conflict. Um, the I talked about it a little bit in the last class. The first, the first national labor struggle in the United States is the, is the Great Rail strike in 18, Railroad Strike in 1877, which is the exact same year as Reconstruction ends, ends in the South. It's a year after Little Bighorn and the, and the, and the, final, and the subsequent crushing of the, uh, uh, of, the Plain, of the Plains Indians. As those issues are resolved, as the West is c conquered, as the Reconstruction is issue is solved, then the, 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 I would argue that then the, you have the, the class divide. It's been there before, but it, but it assumes much greater, much greater salience, much greater prominence in, 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 in American politics and society than for the next, for the, at least till the end of the, at least to the end of the century, and then it's going to, there's going to be, it's going to change a little bit how it's expressed, but it, it's absolutely fundamental to that. Um, and it was a big shock for America, it was a big shock for, for the American elite. They'd gone through this whole period ha happy in the belief that they really did have a society that was very different from Europe. We've avoided all these class tensions of Europe, and but 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 but, but then that ends, and and and, and the, the impact of that on their search, on their turning outwards, on their search for new markets outside the United States is very very is very very marked, and it and it pushes forward this whole drive in in, 18, in 1898. So anyway, that would be, I think it was there before. I just think it it it, it was not the dom it's not the dominant question that it becomes after Reconstruction. Okay, thanks very much. Hope to see you next week. <laughs>